Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. Good morning, church. By a show of hands, how many of you know the name Malcolm Muggeridge? All right, some of you. Malcolm Muggeridge was a British journalist. Um, he was tasked in 1969 with going to Calcutta, India uh, to film a documentary on Mother Teresa for the BBC. Now, initially, Mother Teresa wanted nothing to do with the documentary because she didn't want the spotlight to be on her, but she was convinced by some church leaders. And when she finally agreed to it, these are the words she said. She said, let us do something beautiful for God. In fact, later on, as a result of Mother Teresa's influence, Malcolm Muggeridge ended up becoming a believer, um, and he wrote a book about Mother Teresa called Something Beautiful for God. Now these words, I think, are a nice summary uh, for what's been going on here the past month or so as we've been engaging the Lord in times of prayer and fasting. We've been sharing the need for Bayside 3.0, sensing God's direction to do something beautiful for him in Lakehurst, sensing his direction to refresh and renew this space and make this space beautiful where we gather together for weekly corporate worship, and sensing God's direction to do something beautiful for him across the globe through missions. We've called the people of Bayside Chapel to commit to giving to this beautiful work that God is doing in our midst. And as of Thursday, if you remember what the number was for our, uh, our goal for the pledges, it was 660,000, 300,000 for here, 300,000 for Lakehurst, and then 60,000, uh, which was a tithe to missions. As of Thursday, our commitment so far totaled $547,000. So that's 547 out of our goal of 660. So that's about 83%. We're about 83% uh, there. And um, we know that some commitments are still coming in. So this number we're going to see in the weeks to come, it's going to continue to climb. And, and by the way, this isn't something obviously to be discouraged about at all, because just taking a look at some of our numbers, we have about 550 uh, family units who, who give regularly. And out of those 550, we've received 190 commitment cards, which means there's still a lot more potential for this to climb and exceed that. So if you haven't yet made a commitment and you've been praying, uh, still, still been in a season of prayer, praying to God, asking how he's guiding you and leading you to give to the campaign, I just want to remind you that as you exit later, um, there's commitment cards on both info centers. So you can fill those out, drop one off in the, either of the offering boxes or drop it by the office anytime during the week. So I think we have great reasons to celebrate what God is doing in our midst. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So in light of the fact that God is clearly using us to do something beautiful for him, what better way to celebrate than by praising him and then by giving him thanks? In fact, today we're beginning a new sermon series we're calling Thankful. And this series is going to help us to, to hit the pause button and to reflect on all the different reasons and ways we have to give thanks. And throughout each week, we're going to examine different reasons from different passages, why we should give thanks. And we want to be intentional in reflecting on what we have, God, what we have to give thanks for, both in our church and individually, in each of our lives. 
And over the course of the next six weeks, we're encouraging each one of you to go home and journal daily one thing for which you have to be thankful for. So, so later on when you get home, get out a journal, get out a notepad, open up a note on your phone, and, and, and think about one thing each day that you have to be grateful to God for. And we're going to do this all the way up to Thanksgiving. And there may even come a point in time in the next few weeks where we'll uh, share some of those if you want to share those with us. See, this is a very practical way to bless the Lord, to praise him, and to express gratitude for him. Much the same way that King David called the people of Israel to bless the Lord. See, if you remember from the beginning of 1 Chronicles 29, which we looked at last week, we saw that King David had such a deep desire to build a temple for the Lord. But God told that David that his son Solomon would be the one who was going to build the temple. So David did everything he could to get everything prepared. He started gathering all the money. He started gathering all the building materials. He started gathering all the laborers so that everything would be set for Solomon. And we saw that David and all the people gave generously just like so many of you have given generously. So what did then David and all Israel do once they took this huge offering? They praised God. They blessed the Lord. They rejoiced in the Lord. So now we're going to look at the next passage that follows from what we looked at last week. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 20, we see David calling upon the people of Israel to bless the Lord. And so what's on the heels of what's been such an exciting month here, our response should also be one of blessing the Lord. In fact, what we learn from this passage is that we should delight in blessing the Lord. That's our big idea that we see all throughout this passage. We should delight in blessing the Lord. Now listen as, uh, as I read to you 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 20. I just want you to listen to the words. It says, therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. For we're strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. O oh Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here, offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we saw that we should delight in blessing the Lord. So David here, the aged king of Israel, goes before the people and blesses the Lord. Now look again. Let's look at verse 10. It says, Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our father, forever and ever. Now, now this notion, this whole idea of us blessing God, it might sound a bit strange, right? Usually when we think of blessing, we think of God blessing us. It's usually in the context of what God has given to us, of what God has done for us, of how God has helped us. So what does it mean then when David says that he blesses the Lord? And how do we bless God? 
Well, blessing the Lord simply means to express admiration for who God is and gratitude for what he has done. To bless the Lord means to recognize the source of all blessings. That's what it means to bless God. And in this passage, David shows us a few reasons why on an occasion like this where we celebrate why we should bless the Lord. And here's the first one. It's because God deserves our highest praise. God alone is worthy of our highest praise. See, David blesses God first by praising him. And to praise someone is simply to celebrate that which is great about that person. So then what is it that David finds praiseworthy about God? Look at this list of amazing attributes that David has in verse 11. It's just one after another after another. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. So let's go back. David starts by saying, yours, O Lord, is the greatness. God is great. He's expansive. He's immense. He cannot be contained. He holds the vastness of the universe in the palm of his hands, and he's larger than any reality in the universe. That's what it means to say God is great. Then David goes on. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the what? And the power. God's not only big, but he's strong. God is powerful. See, theologians use the term omnipotence to refer to the, to the fact that all power belongs to God. God is all-powerful, omnipotent. And to say that God is omnipotent is to say that he is the source of all power, that all the power that exists ultimately belongs to him. He's more powerful than any human so, uh, force. He's more powerful than any force in nature. He's more powerful than anything and everyone. And God has now the same amount of power that he had when he called the heavens and, and the earth into existence and when he called the stars into being. There's no limit whatsoever to God's power. He will never have any less power than he has now since he has all the power that there possibly can be. God is great and God is powerful. And that means that you have the power to overcome that temptation or that struggle that you're dealing with. It means that you have the power to do this challenging thing that God is calling you to do. Because if you're a child of God, guess what? It's not your power, it's his power in and through you, amen? Amen. And David goes on, he says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the what? And the glory. See, God's not only big, God's not only strong, but he's splendid. God is glorious. And this word glory implies beauty, right? The awe that we experience from staring at a sunrise. The fascination that we feel from being mesmerized with the ocean surf. The wonder that we sense when we gaze into the starry night sky. These are all glimpses into the beautiful glory and splendor of our God. He is great, he is powerful, and he is glorious. And David keeps going. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory. See, God's not only big, God's not only strong, he's not only splendid, but he's triumphant. God is victorious, he is victor. That God is victorious means that he cannot be defeated. It means that nothing and no one can stand in his way. It means that God will prevail no matter what. He's great, he's powerful, he's glorious, and he is victorious. And it means that no weapon formed against us shall prosper because God is the victor. And David keeps going. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the, let me hear you, and the majesty, right? God's not only big, God's not only strong, he's not only splendid, he's not only triumphant, but he is magnificent. God is majestic. He's mightier than everything else. His, he is royalty in its purest, most magnificent form. And he is the one who deserves our absolute allegiance. He is great and powerful and glorious and victorious and majestic. And then David goes on and he says, for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. 
See, not only do all of these attributes belong to God, but what David's getting at here is that everything belongs to God. All that is in the heavens and the earth is his. God is the owner of all things. He owns the world and he owns everything in it. He owns the stars that he hung in space. He owns the mountains that he formed on the earth. He owns the oceans and he owns everything that swims in them. From the smallest cell on earth to the deepest reaches of space, there is nothing that exists outside of God that God does not own. He is the owner of all things. And then look at the second half of verse 11. He says, yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. In other words, not only does God own everything, but he rules over everything. God is king. Now think about this for a minute. Here you have Israel's greatest king, King David, bowing down to a king who he identifies as even greater than himself, a king whose kingdom is far superior than his own earthly kingdom. And what he's getting at here is that God has dominion and he's the leader of all things and has authority over all things. He's not a distant and and disengaged God, but God is actively involved in the affairs of mankind. He's actively involved in your world and in mine. He maintains the cycles of the universe. He rules and overrules the designs of mankind and he sets the course of history and of eternity. He is king over all kings. He is lord over all lords and he is ruler over all nations. He made it all, he owns it all, and he rules it all. What huge thoughts David has about God. So let me pause for a second and ask you, are these the kinds of thoughts that you think toward God? Do you regularly praise God for who he truly is, who who scripture reveals him to be? See, I think many of us tend to have small thoughts about God, and maybe we don't really focus on these magnificent attributes because we really can't comprehend them completely. See, the problem is, If we don't take God for who he is, for example, if we relate to God only as friend, then his immensity gets lost on us. If we try to comprehend the perfect and infinite God in our imperfect and finite minds, then all we're really doing is trying to contain God. But clearly the God of the Bible cannot be contained. He is the eternal king. He is the final authority. As David said, he is exalted as head above all, meaning that he has authority over the world and he has authority over your world and authority over my world. So maybe, just maybe, in our times of prayer, in our moments of worship, as we go about our daily routines and our daily activities, Maybe we need to focus less on the problems and anxieties in our little worlds and instead fix our eyes upon the power and majesty of God. He is the one who deserves our highest praise because of who he is. He is the great and powerful and glorious and victorious and majestic creator and ruler. And then what we see in verse 12 is that he's also the source of everything. Here's what David says. He says, both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. What David's saying here is that every good gift that we have ultimately comes from God. Whether it's any kind of wealth, any form of authority, any sort of strength, any type of influence, God is the one who's responsible for it all. It comes from him. He is the source. And he's the source whether or not we recognize and praise him as such. See, the invisible hand of God is at work in, behind, and under all that we have and everything that we do. See, if any one of us is anything more than a beggar, it's because of God. If we have anything to our name at all, it's because God gave it to us. Nothing has come to us automatically. Nothing has come to us by right. Everything we have, whether it's a talent or ability, anything that we get credit for, any of our wealth, all comes from the God who chose to give it to us. He is the source. So because of who God is and how generous he is with himself and in giving good things to, to his children, we should delight in blessing him. 
So not only does God deserve our highest praise, not only is God alone worthy of our highest praise, but then we see another reason why we should delight in blessing the Lord, and that's this. God deserves our deepest thanks. He deserves our highest praise, and he deserves our deepest thanks. Look at verse 13. And David says, And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Now remember the context of what's going on here. They had just taken a huge offering like we did last week. And maybe some of them were expecting a voice to thunder down from the heavens and say, thank you for giving so generously to my temple. (laughs) But that's not what happens. Instead, David reminds the people that they gave to God what had already been given to them from God. So really, he is still the one that we should express gratitude to. Even when we give, we should be thanking God that we have the opportunity to give. Look at what David continues to pray in verse 14. He says, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. See, do you see what David's saying to God here? He's praying, God, who are we that we should even presume to be able to give anything to you? Everything comes comes from you. All we're doing is simply giving back what's already yours. And you see, David understood something here about stewardship. See, stewardship is, is not a question of how much of my resources will I give to God? Stewardship is a question of how much of God's own resources will I return to him? How much of the resources that he has entrusted me will I give back to him? And we need to constantly remember that even in our generous giving, whether it's wealth or talent, even our generous giving in and of itself is an undeserved gift from God. Right? The fact that we get to, I said get to, I didn't say have to, The fact that we get to give freely and generously to God is something to celebrate. It's something that we should be thankful for, and it's something that should bring us great joy. See, usually the times where we're self-centered or or tight-fisted in our giving, those are the times that we neglect the reality that it all belongs to God anyway. Right, it's those times when we think we're, we're giving out of an abundance of everything we've worked so hard for, everything that we own. But make no mistake, God doesn't need your time. God doesn't need your talent. God doesn't need your wealth. There's nothing that we have that God needs. There's nothing that he's lacking that we can give to him. What God does desire, on the other hand, is different. See, he desires that we be people of deep thanks because we recognize that he's the source of all blessings. And he invites us to trust in his faithful provision by giving back to him some of what's already his, but not because he's lacking anything. Think of it this way. If... Olivia and Elizabeth were to come up to me and they were to say, Dad, Dad, can I please have $10? I want to buy you something for your birthday. My reaction would be one of joy. Of course I'd give them the $10. I'd delight in giving them the money and they'd have a blast and find so much enjoyment in buying me a gift that was worth the $10 that I gave them. See, but only a fool would think that I'm $10 richer because of the transaction. It was my money to begin with. See, all that we have belongs to God. So when we give, we do it out of what he has already given to us because the reality is that we're not entitled to anything. And that's exactly what David gets at in verse 15. He says, for we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. Remember, Israel began as a wandering people. They didn't have any land to claim as their own. God didn't owe them anything, yet he blessed them by giving them a land flowing with milk and honey. And even so, David recognized that they did not deserve the inheritance of the promised land. And as long as they were living there, they were going to live there lightly. They were going to live there in anticipation of a better and future kingdom. And David also recognizes the brevity of life when he says our days on the earth are like a shadow. See, our lives upon this earth are nothing more than shadows that move ever so quickly and fade from the face of the earth. 
No amount of wealth, no amount of power, no amount of security, no amount of popularity, no amount of fame, none of this can alter the reality that we are but shadows. See, as followers of Christ, we're also to live as aliens and strangers, knowing that this land, this earth, is not our final destination. Amen. Oftentimes, though, we act as if it is, don't we? Right? We sometimes stake our claim on this earth as if we're entitled to our own little kingdoms, and all we're interested in doing is expanding our own little kingdoms. Right? We sometimes dig deep roots as if we're going to live here forever. The way we spend our time might make it seem like this is our final home. The way we spend our money might show whose kingdom it is we really are interested in building. How we use our gifts and the way we prioritize life, these are other ways by which we can gauge whether or not we take seriously the fact that this earth is not our home. Our home is with the Lord in heaven. But because this isn't our final destination, because our days pass here like a shadow, whatever abundance we do get to enjoy in this life is a gift from God and it serves as a reminder of the deep gratitude that he deserves from us. Look at verse 16. David says, O Lord our God, all this abundance that we've provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. See, in spite of the fact that, that we have no standing, we have no claims to, to anything, we have no rights before God, we, we're not entitled to anything, even so, God is extraordinarily generous with us. That's why we should delight in blessing the Lord. Because of who he is, God deserves our highest praise, and because of all he has done for us and given to us, God deserves our deepest thanks. And then we see a third reason why we should delight in blessing the Lord. It's because God deserves our fullest devotion. Amen. God deserves our fullest devotion. So we've seen David lift his voice in praise to God. We've seen him lift his voice in thanksgiving to God. And now he makes a petition before God, starting in verse 17. He says this, he says, I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here, offering freely and joyously to you. See, David acknowledges before the Lord that the important thing is our heart. That's really what matters. When we give, when we serve, how we live, what really matters to God is the heart behind it all, because that's what God is really after. I love the way Pastor Joe says, God's not interested in the product, he's interested in the process. A fully devoted and a completely surrendered heart is what pleases God. And when this is what drives our giving, when this is what drives our serving, when this is what drives how we live, then we're getting it right. Then we're truly blessing the Lord. But here's the thing. David was also smart enough to know that we grow weary over time. Our commitments grow dim over time. We get tired. We're quick to forget. See, no matter how well-intentioned our commitment to the Lord is, it can fade as time goes on. And this is why David prays this in verse 18. He says, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. See, David asks God to guard what he cannot, the hearts of the people. And, and this here is, is the center of what David's petition is. And a petition, by the way, simply means that we present a, God, a request to God that cannot be accomplished by anybody else. It's an acknowledgement that God is greater that, than any other and that he can do what no one else can. So we see David petitioning the Lord. He's saying, God, give the people hearts that are committed to you. Give them hearts that desire to be extraordinarily generous in building something beautiful for you. Enable them to be loyal and devoted to you. And then, in verse 19, he prays for his son, the next leader of Israel. He says, grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart. There's heart again. That's the third time he's used the word heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. 
See, if the people are expected to remain devoted to God, to do something beautiful for God, their leaders are going to need to model that devotion, that commitment. And so for those of us who have given to Bayside 3.0, leaders and members alike, this isn't so much the end of a campaign as it is the beginning of a three-year commitment. And if we're to remain committed during these three years, we need the Lord. See, the reason David is so intentional in praying for the hearts of the people and the hearts of the leaders is because he deeply understood that apart from God, our hearts are going to go after anything and everything but God. This is why we need to be a praying people, seeking God's best for our lives, seeking that God's will be accomplished in our lives and in the life of our church, and seeking him to help us remain committed to what he wants to accomplish through us here at Bayside, what he wants to accomplish at Lakehurst, what he wants to accomplish across the globe through our missionaries. Apart from God, our hearts go after anything but God. And this is why it's so important that we surrender to the Spirit's work in our lives. As he moves us out of the control center in our hearts, and as we give him permission to take full ownership and full occupancy of our entire being. So maybe we should be praying something like, Lord, keep our hearts loyal to you, because you alone deserve our fullest devotion. Lord, and we need your Spirit to empower us to remain committed and surrender to you. And then after David finishes his prayer, he turns to the people in verse 20. Then David said to all the assembly, bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and they bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. Imagine that scene. Thousands of people, including national leaders, falling on their faces before God in worship. And what a legacy this is. What a legacy that David leaves for his son and what a legacy that David leaves for us. One of prayer and one of praise. So we should delight in blessing the Lord, praising God for who he is, thanking him for all that he's done for us and everything that he's given to us and committing our loyalty to him because he is faithful, because he is worthy, because he is father. So just as David urged the assembly to bless the Lord, so I urge every one of you here this morning, bless the Lord your God. He is the eternally great and mighty one who deserves the highest praise. To him belongs the glory, the power, the victory, the majesty, the splendor, and all authority. He's the generous owner of all things and deserves our deepest thanks. Though we're not entitled to a thing, he has blessed us abundantly and he's blessed us beyond comprehension in sending his son to take on flesh, to live and die and rise for us so that when we trust in him, we get new life both now and forevermore. Everything we have comes from God's mighty hand. And because of who he is and what he's done for us and what he's given to us, he is the only one worthy of our fullest devotion. So Bayside Chapel, let's stand and bless the Lord our God together.